I'm Paul Butler. I'm the President and Chief Transformation Officer here at New America. I wanted to say good morning to those of you who are here in the room. Thanks for coming. Um, and to those of you who are joining online, thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are online, just a little housekeeping note, just refresh your browser. Uh, that'll make sure you're up to date and up to speed where exactly we are. Um, in this room. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a welcome um, and talk a little bit about some of the work at New America and how this event and this program and this fellowship fits into that work. Um, and then we're going to jump right in uh, and do the thing that we all came to do. Um, so as, uh, as we were preparing for this event, I was, I was wondering what I would tell you uh, about the work that we do here at New America, particularly the work that we do around equity um, and how we're thinking about equity in the context of our work here at New America. Um, I, I thought I might tell you about um, how we think about the three key changes that are really shaping society. Uh, and we talk about um, borderless global threats that are affecting all of us. We talk about technological change that's reshaping our lives. And we're talking about demographic change um, that is really reshaping the culture, uh, the norms, and the systems that we experience here in our society and really globally. Um, and I thought I might tell you um, about that demographic change, um, but many of you already know, that we are moving to a point in our society uh, that we've never been before, where there will be no white majority, uh, and we will be the first time in our nation a plurality and that has ra radical implications uh, for the work that we all do. Um, but you all know that. Um, I thought I might talk then about our equity transformation at New America. This is a journey that we've been on really for the last two years, like many organizations, um, and like the work that many of you are doing and like the work that this program and this fellowship will be doing, to put equity at the center of our work. Um, and I would tell you about how our approach is really to transform New America for the New America on three levels. The individual level, um, so our, our own personal biases, how we see the world, what we know about the world. The organizational transformation, the policies and systems that operate within this organization. And then the societal transformation, how the individual and the organizational work can impact what happens out there in the world. And then I would tell you about equity in the center of five clusters of work that we do here at New America. And in five words, it's democracy, technology, education, family, and global. And in all of those clusters, we think about four commitments that run across all of that work. The first one is equity. The second one, very appropriate today, is field building. And those two commitments run across all of the work that we do here at New America and is in part why we are here today. And then I would tell you, not about the programs, but I would want to tell you about the people. Um, and there are many people here at New America who are doing the important work of transforming this organization, transforming themselves, and transforming the world outside of New America. And so here we are today uh, to welcome a group of people who are going to continue, extend, expand, take us into new territories for how that work will continue in a very particular space that is important to all of us and ties back to those three changes that I talked about in the very beginning. So I wanted to first ask the new class of the Share the Mic Fellows just to stand, stand where you are, be recognized so we can welcome you and recognize you. I wanted to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I wanted to thank you, the fellows, for the work that you've already been doing. Um, and thank you in advance for the work that you will be doing. Uh, you can take a seat. Uh, <laughs> we will meet more, we'll meet them more later. Um, and finally, as I leave the stage and pass the mic um, and share the mic in a different way, um, I wanted to thank Peter Singer, 
uh, our fellow at New America who is leading the effort from inside. He has, talk, he has been talking about this for a while with such passion and such commitment that this is something that we need to support at New America, and so we are happy to follow his lead. Uh, I wanted to thank Bridget Chan, uh, who's out there somewhere making sure that this is happening and this is all connecting. Um, and I wanted to thank Camille Stewart and Lauren Zabrick for their vision to actually bring us to this moment. And with that, I am going to bring up a co-founder of Share the Mic, uh, Lauren Zabrick, and the advisor to Share the Mic, Christina Murillo. Thank you all. I, you know, I'm just looking out at you all and, you know, I'm, I'm just reminded and really blown away by, you know, how everyone is here right now for this one purpose. I mean, this is truly amazing. Um, but before we get into that, I, you know, I first want to say thank you to Paul for, you know, really just allowing us to create this here and for your support. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank Peter Singer for, um, you know, your uh, leadership, your advice, your, your sort of vision here. I, you know, I'll, I'll just say real quick, um, last year we, you know, kind of went after some money and then it didn't come through. Um, and then we're like, well, wait, why don't we just put together a, a fellowship? Like, let's actually build something. And that was really thanks to Peter. Um, so I just want to thank him for leaning forward and, and for your vision and, and, you know, making this really happen. Um, and I want to thank Bridget, too. I know she's, as Paul said, running around trying to get a few things, um, uh, you know, set. But, you know, we hired Bridget um, this past summer. And it was funny because I was, I was talking to her. I think we were having a meeting. And mm -hmm. I was like, you've been here for a year, right? She's like, no, <laughs> it's only been a couple of months. But uh, <laughs> she you know, really hit the ground running. She, you know, just believed in this program so much and she did so much to lay the groundwork for this fellowship. And I'm just so appreciative of her, you know, her skills and her motivation and, and you know, um, you know, excitement in doing this. So I just want to thank them. Um, I also want to thank the sponsors for Share the Mic and Cyber for the fellowship. We couldn't be here without their support. Um, so Google, um, Twitter, Hewlett, the Hewlett Foundation, and especially Craig Newmark um, Philanthropies. So their generosity um, really, again, has made this happen. Um, so as I said on Twitter, um, you know, with the creation of this fellowship, this vision is realized. And so let's go back a little bit to that vision. <laughs> Um, if you have been here from the start of Share the Mind and Cyber, which Christina has, <laughs> uh, you may know that it happened with really a DM. Um, so I, I had seen the campaign Share the Mic Now on Instagram that um, where uh, prominent figures in entertainment and politics, uh, white women, shared their platforms with black women in those industries. And I just got this idea. This could really be good in cyber and national security. Randomly, I saw Camille's tweet about this. Camille and I did not know each other. I was not following her. Did, we didn't know who each other were. Different states too, right? Different, different states, states yeah. exactly. And I just DM'd her. And then literally within weeks of just, you know, calls and, and you know, uh, texts and emails and things like that, we put this, the first one together. And Peter was, um, you know, was one of those uh, early allies, so he's been there from the beginning. Um, Caitlin, you know, you were you were kind of, I think, observing, right? And then, you know, kind of came in. But, you know, we just kind of put it together and thought, all right, let's just try this. And we were so blown away by the response, and I think it really validated the this idea and the, th the fact that this was actually, you know, really needed in the industry. Um, and then we kept going. I, I sat out the second one because I had a baby, but, you know, Caitlin came in and just like, <laughs> hit the ground running um, and, you know, just made it even bigger and better. Um, so thank you, Caitlin, for, for everything that you've done. She'll, she'll never say like, oh, I'm a part, no, she'll be like, I'm a host. <laughs> but no, I always say, Caitlin, you are the wing beneath sharing the mic and cyber's wings. So 
Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, and we've had, gosh, we just had our fifth Share the Mic in Cyber campaign. Um, at, our, at our biggest campaign, we had had over 100 million impressions on Twitter, which is unimaginable, again, for just sort of this idea that happened. We've had national leaders participate. So in the, especially the last one, we had uh, National Cyber Director Chris Inglis, we had CISA Director Jen Easterly, and we had NSA Cyber Director Rob Joyce participate, in addition to all the amazing allies, and of course, all the amazing black practitioners that participated. So fast forward to this vision, right? We, uh, you know, creating this fellowship. You know, we've talked about the problem, especially, you know, over the last Share the Mic and Cyber campaigns, we've talked about the issue and why diversity is so important for cybersecurity and national security. In the last one, we started to get to how, how we can start to create belonging. But really with this fellowship, I think that idea of how is starting to be crystallized, right? We are moving from talking about it to actually taking action and creating change in the industry. And so I'm so excited for this fellowship and, and the fellows here to actually start doing the work, right? That's the theme of this day is doing the work. Um, and it's not just you that's doing the work, we're all you know, doing the work alongside you. And we're, we're here to support you and um, really excited for, um, you know, where you take it. And so I just, you know, I wanted to, I know you stood up before, but I wanted to, you know, say your names too. So Stephanie, Roshan, Michael, Thomas, Lily, Safi, and Sarah, thank you so much for, for being here. So I did want to kind of kick it over to Christina for a second. As, you know, a Share the Mic and Cyber alum, many time alum, and of course now an advisor at the fellowship. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most important things that Lauren didn't mention is that the tweet impressions are impressive, but I think the most important thing is what has come out of these, you know, the share the Mike and Cyber campaign, and that has been the relationships, the mentorships, the support, the opportunities. I mean, even using me as an example, I was part of the first and I think the second, and, you know, I developed a relationship with Camille and Lauren, and because of that, I became an advisor. So it was because Camille shared the mic. So that's just one example, but there are hundreds, you know, uh, the, it, it's important to, like, tweet someone, but it's more important to, like, take that offline as well and, and um, share the opportunities, including financial opportunities, right? Because that's yeah. what we all want. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm super excited to, to meet all of you. I will tell you that um, I don't get up at 4 o'clock in the morning for just anyone uh, <laughs> and take the Acela in, you know, at 4 o'clock in the morning from New York City. So I'm uh, super happy to be here. Uh, I do need some coffee. Um, but I can't wait to, to, you know, to speak to all of you on a one, and I can't wait to see what you build. I'm super excited. I think, you know, cyber really needs your cre creativity, your innovation. Uh, there's a dearth of innovation in cybersecurity, despite what people say online. Uh, folks are not innovating, right? Uh, it's the same old same. And so I'm super excited. We need fresh blood. We need that inspiration, creativity. We need your work, whatever you put out there. And so I'm super excited to see that as well. So welcome. And I hope you have a great time. Feel free to stop us, ask any questions. And yeah, thanks to Lauren. Bridget, Peter, New America, Caitlin, everyone who has uh, contributed to make this all possible. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I am Kemba Walden. I'm the Principal Deputy National Cyber Director in the White House. We are the newest kids on the block in the White House. Um, So I'm here to talk a little bit about um, cybersecurity, a little bit about me, but mostly about you and your role in it. Um, and I wanted to give you some framing comments. Nothing I'm going to say right now is new to you, but this will give you the perspective from which I speak. Um, so what is ONCD? We were uh, created by statute by Congress. It was passed in January 2021. Our director, Chris Inglis, was nominated by President, uh, uh, President Biden in April of 2021. He was confirmed by the Senate in June or July, walked into the White House, 
and we were not appropriated then until November of last year. Um, and so we've been running at a full sprint for a year since November. We are at initial operating capacity now. Uh, so that's, that's how we got into the office. So what do we do? We have four strategic objectives that we are focused on, federal cohesion, uh, actual public-private collaboration, uh, which is another way of saying information sharing, but information sharing that's souped up. Um, we are focused on current and future resilience. And then the least sexy but um, the most powerful thing we have is making sure that we have performance metrics in place, is aligning resources with aspirations. So those are our four strategic objectives. Um, and then now what is site, so that's, that's kind of who we are and I'll get to what we've done. But so what is cyberspace? Just to step back for a moment. Cyberspace is all the technology that we all have come to know and love, right? The tablets, the hardware, the software, the phones, the watches, all of that, uh, the refrigerators, all of that. Um, but most importantly, cyberspace is people. People are not under cyber, over cyber, around cyber, next to it, they're in it. We've developed cyberspace, we use cyberspace. So in addition to technology, cyberspace is people. And then finally, um, and arguably the most important, cyberspace is process, right? Doctrine. We need to know who's accountable for what and who's responsible for what. Cyberspace is all three of those elements and we have to care for all the vulnerabilities associated in all three of those elements. In the process, in the doctrine section, if we don't know who's guarding the gates, the transgressor is going to walk right through. It's the easiest thing to do. It's the choice that makes sense, right? They'll walk right through an open gate. They, if they can't, if we close that vulnerability and they can't walk through the open gate, the next thing they're going to go to are the people. That's you. That's my mom. That's my kids. They're going to, that, that, the simplest way to see it is in the phishing attacks that happen every day. They're going to find people. They're going to help people lose confidence in their systems. Um, that's where the transgressor is going to go next. The hardest thing for the transgressor to do, in fact, is to go for a zero-day vulnerability in the technology, right? But if we get our house in order, in that order, process, people, and technology, then we've gotten to a better place. We can buy down risk going through the vulnerabilities there. Okay, so that's the next principle I want to describe to you. The final principle I want to describe to you before I get into the DEIA conversation is, is what we are seeking to achieve. The reason I do cyberspace uh, the reason why anyone in my office does cyberspace, I suspect, or cybersecurity, I suspect the reason why most of you do cybersecurity is to make sure that our communities, our individuals can thrive and prosper in the internet, full stop. We just want them to thrive and prosper. Our communities, our individuals, small and medium businesses, customers, we want them to thrive and prosper in a, in a space that is secure, that is resilient, and that is equitable. That's how I imagine the internet. And that's my opportunity, that's my North Star. That's what I do, that's why I do it. I don't do cyber security just for the sake of it. I'm not an engineer, I don't do the tech stuff, it is important, um, but that's not why I do cyber security. So those, those are the sort of big picture framing opportunities for me. So I wanna focus primarily on the people part, right? Um, and that's where DEIA is important. America's superpower is our diversity. There's no country like ours. There are very few countries like ours. Maybe there's one or two, but there are very few countries like ours. Our superpower is that we have people that don't all think alike, that don't all do alike, that, are not in the, that don't have all the same abilities, that don't all look alike. And so we bring the complexity of cybersecurity. We have the, the complexity of our society to be able to bring to bear to solve that problem. Right? That is our superpower. We need to lean into that. It is not only a national security imperative, but it's an economic opportunity. It develops our economy. It develops our technology. We can be innovative because we're diverse, because we're creative. Right? It's not a, it's not a add on. It's, it's our power. That's what we need to use. We haven't been fully realizing our power in this space. And my opportunity is to do that now. So what are we doing about it? 
So this, the, the Office of National Cyber Director has been doing a number of things. The one that I want to talk about mostly, but then we'll talk about other things too, uh, is our workforce national, our national workforce education strategy. In the summer, this past summer, we had a national workforce and education summit that kicked off our work in this space. We started to take a look at what do we want to focus on. We noticed that there are over 700,000 jobs or so that were left unfilled with the word cyber or IT in them, right? That's a national security problem from my perspective. I'm a national security lawyer by training. Uh, but it's also an economic opportunity. It just, I mean, obviously we can fill those jobs. So what do we need to do to fill those jobs? What's our strategy? How are we thinking? What are the barriers? How do we pull those down? What do we do for those jobs that are, are right now unfilled? But then we started to think a little further when we started thinking about pulling down challenges and barriers. We started to think about, I think, and I'm a visual person, so I have pictures in my mind, so excuse my hands. <laughs> so these are concentric circles. Um, but what do we do about those that implicate cyber? People like me, I'm a lawyer, or a policy person, or assembly line worker, or the CEO of a company, or the accountant, those that implicate cyber. What is their cyber awareness? What do we need to do to raise their awareness so that they support those 700,000 or so empty jobs, filling those jobs? But then, and in the National Cyber Director's Office, we're strategic in thinking, so what's our strategy for filling that pipeline? What's the all proposition? What are we doing about cyber education in K through 12 for grandparents, for, for those that need to be reskilled or upskilled? How are we thinking about the pipeline, cyber education? What's being taught in school, right? So there are a number of things that we've come up with. We're looking at best practices at this point. Um, we've kicked off at the White House summit, we kicked off with the Secretary of Labor. Excuse me. There's, there are my hands again. The Secretary of Labor, the Secretary of Commerce, the Secretary of Homeland Security, one of the undersecretaries of education. Why were they important to be there? Because when we start thinking about filling those jobs and finding opportunities so that anybody that wants a job can have it, we need to not only think about the education system, but about the labor system, and then we need a job at the end of that stream, commerce, right? This is a three-legged stool. There are equal parts there. So we had all three departments and agencies recognized at the summit, including the Department of Homeland Security, because this is a national security concern. Um, so we had 19 companies make commitments. The departments and agencies committed to including cybersecurity in the registered apprenticeship program thinking about apprenticeships in these space as an opportunity, as a pipeline, as a pathway to filling those jobs. So we executed a 120-day sprint uh, to do that. We went, the capstone program at the end of the sprint was a trip with the First Lady, the Secretary of uh, Commerce, the Secretary of Education, the Secretary of Labor to Chicago uh, to have the final com several companies sign up for the registered apprenticeship program. I had an opportunity to meet students who were part of that program in the cybersecurity space. Um, and we were able to announce at that time that we had 194 companies register, have registered apprenticeships. That represents about 120 occupations, represents over 7,000 apprenticeships filled, right? It's a dent, it's a great start. Companies are continuing to sign up for these registered apprenticeship programs in partnership with the Department of Labor, Commerce, and Education. So we're not done. It's just the beginning. But that is one pathway, one opportunity. Another opportunity that we've leaned into is looking at uh, HBCUs. We kicked off a cybersecurity workshop uh, at Hampton University at one of the HBCUs to really lean in and talk about opportunities for education, curriculum development, employment afterwards, do you really need all of these certifications or do you need these skills, right? What is it you need in order to succeed in this space? Do you have to be techno a, tech, uh, a technologist? Clearly I'm not. Do you have to be a technologist? No, you don't. You have to be creative, you have to be innovative, but you don't have to be a technologist. Um, we're in, the, we have, ha most of our team are in, uh, in Washington at Wachovia, uh, Wachovia, Whatcom Community College, 
to talk about the same things. Are we using our community colleges to our full advantage? Are we using vocational programs to our full advantage? Do we really need college degrees to fill these jobs? What are the barriers that we are imposing? These are the things that we're trying to answer. We've collected best practices. We issued a RFI that's now closed, but we're still having listening sessions. I think we had about 150 or so responses. We've hired a whole team to go through, call through, really pull out best practices. I, in some of my travels, I've heard of a company that is reskilling uh, using paid internship programs for mothers returning to work, for example, particularly those of us, I'm one of them, that were sort of being school teachers to our children at home, and how do you get back into the workforce, and how do you reskill and upskill? I mean, we're finding these opportunities. We want to leverage them and bring them to bear. So that's our workforce uh, strategy. Our workforce strategy hangs off of our national cybersecurity strategy, which will hopefully come out at some point. Um, but one of the themes, the themes that you'll find in the national cyber strategy that will carry through in the workforce strategy is not only that cyber is, is technology, people, and doctrine, but also that we're looking at shifting the balance of risk, right? Right now, risk is borne by those that use the internet, that use the space, our mothers, our fathers, our kids, our grandparents that are doing online banking, that are hooking up the refrigerator to the internet for God knows what reason, for whatever it is, right? Our mic, all of it is being used. Everybody is in, in, in this space, so, but they bear the risk. Like, God forbid, my seven-year-old son plays Minecraft on my computer and downloads some sort of malware on my computer, which could have national security consequences when I come in and VPN from my own router, right? Like, that is not okay. Uh, so we need to figure out what our strategic investments are to shift the balance of risk to the, those that can bear it and buy it down. The large enterprises, federal government is included in that large, so some, from small to big, from customer to provider. How do we, what are the investments that we need to make to shift the balance of risk so to those that can bear it and afford to buy it down? You all know, I don't have to tell you, that you never get to zero risk. Cybersecurity is an exercise in risk mitigation. You're not going to get to zero. But what you want to do is ha what you have, make what you have defensible, and then with that residual risk, really hone in on resilience, right? Resilience in cyberspace, the technology, the people, the doctrine. What are the strategic investments that we need to make in order to buy down that residual risk? Uh, and that's what, where I proffer that we need to lean into America's superpower, which is diversity, right? This all feeds in also to the Biden-Harris administration's serious contention with cybersecurity. They've done some remarkable work. Uh, so for example, the bipartisan infrastructure law um, will have, again, shifting that balance of risk, is doing grants for, to 355 uh, local municipalities and communities to rebuild America. Our infrastructure, our broadband is included in that. Cyber plans are required for those grants, right? ONCD is there to help with that planning. Um, the electric vehicle systems are getting an influx of funding through the Inflation Reduction Act and through the What's the other law that we just, Chips and Science Act, right? So what are we doing there? So we, for example, had the electric vehicle market come to the White House. We gave them a threat briefing and a vulnerability briefing uh, because, in, in the classified space, because you, don't, you all know that risk is, is, a, is a, uh, a result of threat, vulnerability, and consequence, right? So we gave these executives, everybody has a role to play, you know, we're working on that process, who's accountable for what, uh, who's responsible for what, so we gave the C-suite in that market um, a threat briefing and a, vulnerab a vulnerability briefing, and then we had the consequence conversation outside of the room in the public space with the government, with the labor, with energy, with our climate office in the White House to figure out what are the strategic investments that that community needs to make as they have the influx of cash from the Inflation Re Reduction Act to develop the market, right? Cybersecurity is an opportunity for technical innovation, right? You, it's, not, it's not one or the other. It's not national security at the expense of innovation. It's both and. 
right? So cybersecurity, in our view, is about national security, economic opportunity, technical innovation. Those the marriage of all three of those that we need to lead into in order to progress, in order to make the North Star happen, make sure that our communities are able to thrive and prosper in the Internet, full stop. That is the, that's what we're here doing. That's what we're working on. I read all the, the fellows. I read your research ideas. I'm excited about them. Um, I've talked quite a bit, and I know I have a hard stop. But after reading your backgrounds, I am super interested in, I think we have time for a question or two, super interested in your feedback, your questions, any opportunities that you think that I should lean into. I would love to hear that. I'll say while, you, while you're thinking about it, I was one of the first, and I think I was in one of the first cohorts of Share the Mic you in were. 20. Yeah, I 19 remember. maybe? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, now, so I'm the, now I'm in the White House, so look at what Share the Mic does. <laughs> and Camille, too, now she's in right? the White House. I mean, yeah, she's incredible. <laughs> Stephanie, go ahead. Hi, my name is Stephanie Schilling, and part of my research project is trying to baseline the cyber, uh, the cyber knowledge and the digital, aware, uh, the digital resiliency of the American people, mm -hmm. in part because I strongly believe that cyber a lot of it is people, and I think that people wanting to do the right thing but not knowing how. That's right. What are we doing to try to pull this training information outside behind the corporate paywalls? Because we have some of our most vulnerable communities who desperately need this information who just don't have access to it. So when I talk about our workforce strategy and what our strategic intentions are, one of the things that the team is charged to do is to find, figure out what the barriers are, what the challenges are, and remove them, right? Make investments to remove them. Uh, we're not going to necessarily uh, be able to regulate the companies that have data that's behind the payroll, paywall. But what we have to do is influence them to understand their role in this space, right? It's that shifting the burden of risk. Um, when our national cyber strategy comes out, and I, and I can't tell you many details, but we've, we've concluded there, and we, we've said before in public, that market forces aren't working in the way that they, we need to have them work. So we need to do something a little bit beyond the voluntary notion, sort of the goodwill notion. The Internet's public good, and it's owned by uh, the private sector at this point. We need to be able to influence them, if that's a carrot, if that's a stick, I don't know, I, I view some sticks as carrots sometimes. Um, but we need, to be, we need to be a little bit more forceful and find other innovative ways other than market forces to encourage that kind of behavior. But yes, we're, we're pulling down, we're figuring out how to pull down the barriers. If you have any ideas through your research, I would welcome that. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's absolutely right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I look forward to that conversation. Thank you. Safi, come on up. Um, I think, you know, this is very timely for a lot of us. We, a bunch of us met up last night and we're talking about this type of thing. Um, but specifically, my comment question is, you know, I hear a lot about like making sure we have like the workforce development and we have, you know, a lot of the pieces that are working together from the private uh, public space. But I think at some point we kind of maybe need to like take a pause and look at like access, right? Like mm -hmm. how are people who are most disadvantaged accessing the internet mm -hmm. and kind of make maybe taking a, a look at how we can either get better regulation around, you know, like private, uh, excuse me, public uh, internets, like places where people who, you know, are living in the digital divide don't have access yeah. to a laptop at home. So now they're going to Starbucks to pay their bills on a public Wi-Fi, right? Like those are the types of situations that I think we really need to take a look at, you know, if we're trying to solve a problem, we have to figure out why it's a problem for some people and without the understanding of, you know, where, where are there some of the shortcomings um, in terms of access for people across the nation, right? Like mm -hmm. rural areas, you know, to mention, not to mention, you know, like inner cities, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned a lot um, about the, the, you know, K through 12 education mm -hmm. and improving that. You know, I think 
at a certain point, I would love to see in this country for the internet to be a utility, yeah. right? It's something that everyone, it's their right, right? Yeah. You have it's gas, you good. have water, yeah. it's a public good, right? Yeah. And so some of, you know, at a certain point where, you know, where's their room or area for growth for subsidizing a lot of that stuff for members who are not fortunate enough to, you know, be able to pay those bills themselves. And as a result, you mentioned, you know, you might have your kid or, you know, someone else getting onto your laptop doing things that you wouldn't necessarily want them to do, but the alternative for some of those people are doing those things in public on a mobile phone, right? Mm -hmm. So um, long story to say, like part of my research and my um, dissertation is really talking about how the increase in advancement of technology is really leaving behind people in terms of like entire communities mm -hmm. from being able to protect themselves and their privacy online. So I think one of the things we should really, as a group, and I know it's one of the things that a few of us are focusing on is just really how to make that right become, you know, or the, the right to having access to secure internet and, you know, all the things that come along with the opportunity, you know, job, and job remote work, um, how do we make sure those things translate into, you know, a dollar that someone right. now doesn't have to spend on the internet and now can, you know, buy food for their family, so. Yeah, I don't know if I have anything to say, because uh, you've said it all, I mean, that's, yes. Um, uh, so a few things come to mind as you're talking. Uh, the, so the bipartisan infrastructure law, the reason why I mentioned that is because part of that law is to bring broadband to rural areas, to expand internet accessibility into not just urban centers, but way out there in rural areas. Um, we need to build resilience into that, right? We need, to, we need to build in, remember the commercial with the red easy button? I don't remember what that was, Staples? Staples. The easy button, right? I, we don't, we don't need people, we need to talk to providers too about this. We don't need people to try to figure out to, whether to turn on their logging or how to turn on multi-factor or not. It just needs to be an easy button. And that's what it is. It's built in um, by default. And so as the Department of Commerce, who has, who has uh, jurisdiction over that part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the grants that are associated with that the build out of broadband, we are integrated with them. I've met with my counterpart at Commerce. I keep, you know, like as you, as you deliver these grants, you have to have certain cybersecurity measures built in in order to win the grant, right? So that's the work that we do. We're that cartilage that makes the fingers work, right? But we're the, that's what we do. That's how we are thinking. The other thing that came to mind when you were talking, um, I, in Texas, I, I, can't, I think it was Austin, we went and visited a high school. It's called ICSI. Um, this high school figured out how to develop an uh, after-school program from, for, for a students in a, a disadvantaged area or uh, a, a disinvested area of Austin um, to allow these students to be able to come in they learn how to run a sock they understand the OSI stack they can put together a router I mean it's it's I went to it is beautiful space they have become accredited now to offer um, certification testing in their facility so that these students by the time they graduate, they might have a CISSP, they might have a CEH, they might have a CISM, um, but they are, they, are, they are not required then to take a bus to some testing center in a little slightly scary space, it's a, right? So we've got to be innovative and thoughtful and lean into these opportunities. Reach people where they are. Reach people where they are and figure out how to, how to break down those barriers. Um, we need to find those best practices highlight them and then scale them scale them up there are other opportunities where industry is pairing with at that level that high school level to feed a pipeline right because you need a job at the end of it right a lot of those kids um, their parents don't understand what cybersecurity is they understand you're gonna go to school you're gonna be a doctor or a, or a lawyer right that's what my that's how why I'm a lawyer right um, <laughs> But educating the parents about what it is and what it's about, what cybersecurity is about, and how it is a, a viable economic uh, opportunity for their kids, right? So all these pieces play together. Uh, and there's something for everybody to touch. But remember the North Star, the power that you have right now is not about the cybersecurity. It's about making communities thrive. That's it, full stop. That's what, that's what I believe you're called to do in your research and whatever it is you're working on. That's what, that's what it is at the end of the day.
that time. So I, I want to thank you. I know you have uh, you know, a place you need to be. So I just want to thank you so much for being here. You're amazing. We're so thank excited. You. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm Peter Singer, and um, I just wanted to add uh, three things. One is um, my excitement um, at this event, um, both the panel, but also the overall launch. As um, was said earlier, this really is the culmination of something that went from idea to reality. And there's, there's excitement in that. There's, there's pride that something actually really happened. Um, uh, you know, in many ways, this is like a startup that, um, you know, it's the unicorn that, that made it. Um, but there's also uh, a sense of anticipation um, in what comes next. Uh, and this is where I put my wonk hat on. Um, there is anticipation for me in what comes next in the projects that you're going to do. I've actually read the project proposals. I know the kind of research and the interesting questions. And I'm personally and professionally excited to really see them develop and see the fruits of it come out over the next couple of months. Um, the second reason it, that um, I'm excited by this goes to um, the topic, but also the approach. Um, in terms of this idea of doing the work. Um, I know personally, uh, I've been writing on, uh, we called them workforce questions in cybersecurity since um, 2014. I see Laura Bade in the background, an old uh, New America alum. This is not a new topic. It's been with us for a long while. And it's really cool to see it move to the next level from treating it as something that you have to make the case for to now actually, again, doing the work. And that leads to the third reason of excitement is um, we've got a really great group here to uh, explore um, what this all means to do the work. Uh, so we have uh, Jorina Thomas, who's Director of Professional Advancement at a really cool organization. Um, and I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna say this twice, a really awesome named organization. Uh, we were talking about this in the back about branding, Girl Security. Um, then we have uh, Tyrants um, Billingsley. Uh, he's founder and CEO of another awesomely named organization, Black Tech Street. Um, and then Caitlin Ring, uh, Ring Rose, who is um, lead for global law enforcement and government access at, it is a cool name, it's just been with us for a long time, <laughs> which is Google. Um, and so with that, let's jump right in. Um, can you tell us all about the work that your organizations are currently doing to advance DEIA in the cybersecurity workforce. And I'm just gonna, um, we'll just keep, we'll go in order through, so. Okay, sure, nice to be here. Hi, everyone, my name is Jarena. So thanks for that intro, Peter. So I would say to start, Girl Security, our mission is to work with girls in high school and up into about 26 years old to expose them to national security and um, help them get into the field and then also to thrive while they're there. So of course national security covers a range of, of professions but also cybersecurity. So the main thing that we do is try to bring them and expose them to the different facets of cybersecurity and kind of demystify it too. Because a lot of times I think when people hear cybersecurity, their eyes glaze over, they don't really know what it is and they think it's just something technical and they don't want to be bothered. But we really try to help them to understand and expose them to different professionals and potential mentors um, that cybersecurity is a range of things. It could be trust and safety. It could be the technical stuff. It could be um, many different things, policy, things like that. So we try to expose them and then help them to find where their niche is and then give them mentors to help them on their way. Can you give a, a specific example when you say expose? Like what what does that mean? What does that look like in the real? So what that looks like as a practical matter is those that are a part of our program, we bring them in and we do very practical workshops. So we say, 
here's an issue. Let's talk about it. And let's talk about it from all different sides. So we do scenario-based uh, training and scenario-based workshops so they can kind of get their hands dirty a little bit. That's one. And then the other thing I'd say is the mentorship piece. That's a huge piece of what we do. And so we pair them with professionals in the field, professional women in the field, to help them learn more, help them to have someone to bounce their questions off of and expose them in that way. So those are two major ways that we, we expose them. Because I'm a big believer in exposure. Like you, you're really limited by what you're exposed to. You know, I know a lot of people, I'm, I'm from Chicago, and I know a lot of people that I grew up with kind of just stopped at the borders of Illinois because they weren't exposed to other things and other types of jobs and other things that they could do. Everything else was kind of mystified. So I think that our ability to expose girls and young women to what's available in national security broadly, but also in the, the very complex realm of cybersecurity is very useful. So I could probably start with a little background. How many of you have uh, heard of Black Wall Street? Raise your hand. Well, that's, um, that's really, I'm, I'm glad to see that. <laughs> a couple of years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. Yeah. So. Black Wall Street, um, I'm just going into the origin to kind of explain how we do our work. So you have the most affluent community of African Americans in the history of the country at the time, destroyed in the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. That's kind of defined the narrative ever since. So 100 years later, I kind of began to ask myself the question, what could Black Wall Street have been had it been supported and not destroyed? And when I looked, thought about the level of tenacity that it took for these entrepreneurs to build incredible businesses during Jim Crow, the smashing through walls and the out-of-the-box thinking reminded me a lot of the tech industry. And that kind of led me to a three-pronged epiphany. One, tech is one of the only industries in which you can build intergenerational wealth in seven to 10 years via successful company exit. Two, tech is the core medium through which all global innovation and the creation of new wealth generating markets takes place pretty consistently. And three, by the year 20, 2030, there are projected to be as many as 4.3 million high-paying vacant tech jobs due to a tech talent shortage. So when I put those three things together, I not only saw an incredible wealth building opportunity for black people, I saw the Black Wall Street vision kind of push to a new horizon. So I surmised that had Black Wall Street been supported and not destroyed, it would be nothing other than the nation's premier black tech ecosystem. So that's where the name Black Tech Street comes from. And our mission is to rebirth Black Wall Street as a black tech capital, but also catalyze a movement that sees black people embrace tech as a means to build wealth and impact the world. So in the day-to-day, -day, we serve, um, we kind of serve as a facilitator and liaison between the Tulsa ecosystem and black tech opportunities. So we partner with different organizations and companies to secure opportunities that will help black people either break into the tech workforce or become tech entrepreneurs. Recently, we actually hosted Microsoft in Tulsa um, for an initiative that, to preview an initiative that we're calling the Digital Transformation of Black Wall Street to Black Tech Street. Those two individuals are high up in the cybersecurity area of Microsoft. And one of the things that we'll actually be doing is creating different programs and supporting programs to train African Americans in cybersecurity. Um, you know, and actually, in Microsoft is actually really given a commitment that if we can train a certain amount of indivi black individuals, they'll build a facility in Tulsa. So, I mean, it's, um, uh, yeah, don't quote that yet. That's still coming. That's still coming down the line, but that's what You said that's don't what quote. Said. We're, heads up. We're that's, online. That's, that's what, so. yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah. They've, given that, they've given that commitment. That's far off. But, but yes, but in, in short, we're engaging with Microsoft because cybersecurity and AI are two verticals that are going to have universal penetration with all the others. So the wealth generating potential and the impact potential is massive there. So changing the narrative of what a person in tech looks like and creating the right pathways is kind of what Black Tech Street's core work is. Well, don't just work with Microsoft, work with Google, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> first off, it's so good to see everyone here. I feel like we've seen each other virtually, and we've on emails, and it's just really good to, to be here in person. Um, I feel like I've just been smiling so much today. My face is like hurting already, um, and I can't wait to see you, you know, after this too. I feel like I'm here wearing kind of two hats, right? First, I'm here to represent Google and our work on cyber and DEI, um, and also as a Sure the Mic and cyber co-hosts. And so I want to speak to both. Um, first, at Google, we recently created something called the Cybersecurity Action Team. And the whole point of that team is to be flexible and plug into other teams and functions to make sure that our security team, our security comms folks, our policy leads, our engineers 
are all really focused on inclusive hiring, representation, and making sure that folks, when they're at Google, feel and are accepted and understood and have a, a very valuable voice at all of these tables. So I think that's important um, to flag first off. And secondly, that we're also putting our, our money where our mouth is. So last year, we pledged $10 billion to cybersecurity over the next three years. Um, and what that looks like is it's, it's a big pot of money. It's really going to, to change the face of cybersecurity. Uh, and part of that is we're pledging to train 100,000 Americans um, with Google cybersecurity skills. So that's our certificates in IT, data analytics, et cetera. Um, so far, over half of our applicants to that program, and everyone can apply, have been from the lowest one-third of the economic bracket in the US, and over a half have been from diverse backgrounds, too. So um, black people, women, veterans, et cetera. And I want to say um, there's something in a certificate, right? that it's not just about the learning you get, but the outcomes that you receive after. So it could be something like you get a promotion at work, you get a new job offer, you're able to pivot careers. Maybe you're a nurse and you care about cybersecurity and how it impacts hospitals, and so you start to um, pivot your job. And that's what we've been really focused on. So we've done some statistic gathering, and 86% of graduates from this early certificate programs have gone gone on to report like a positive career impact in one of those areas. Um, and speaking from Share the Mic and Cyber, I want to say you all know about the mission. You know why it's important. We talked a lot today about hiring and getting folks into the field. But there's something really critical to say about supporting people who are in it already, who um, are doing the work of securing our data, our people, and our country every single day, um, and that aren't being celebrated and aren't being affirmed at work. And so it's our place to, as Sherman Mike and Cyber, and as colleagues and as friends, to affirm one another. Um, so I think that's something that's really important about Sherman Mike and Cyber's work and something that we should all be bringing to, to our own roles. So I want to take the conversation into um, a bit of a, a, a tougher part, which is, as I referenced in my opening, um, we've been talking about these issues for a while. Mm -hmm. um, what part of the conversation around diversity in the cybersecurity field has been helpful? And are there parts of it that have not been helpful or not been valuable or maybe even been um, harmful? Uh, so I'm just going to go in the same order again to give people a chance to, to explore that. I think that's a good question. I think on the, the harmful and not helpful side, and this goes in any conversation about diversity, I think the tropes that are pulled out are unhelpful. And what I mean by that is when we talk about certain groups of people or we, we conflate being a minority with being poor, for example. So those things are pulled out, and I don't, I don't think that they're done maliciously or intentionally, but they come out. And so I think that's not helpful because it stereotypes people. So that's the negative. But the positive, I think, is that we're having these conversations. And there have been a lot of studies done on the cybersecurity workforce. I, I just read one recently that ISC Squared put out. And it was really interesting. And it's, it actually said that the percentage of minorities in the cybersecurity workforce is actually um, not as dire as we kind of make it seem. I think it was like 20-something percent, and which is still not great, but it's not as bad as, as we made it seem. So I think, so my point is, I think the positive is that we're having these conversations. People are doing studies on the, the topic and pulling out truths as opposed to like the stereotypes or the things that um, we generally talk about that may or may not be true. So. Um. Yeah, this can be, there's a lot of different facets to this, um, and you do see this in a lot of different areas of DEI work. The reason why people will often scout or want more diversity, sometimes when it's presented in a way that it's solely because we just want more talent to hit benchmarks, or it's solely because we want to look good, um, that narrative can be damaging. I mean, yes, I'm all for mutually, mutual benefit, but I mean, 
sometimes that can be damaging. I think it's more important to have narratives that actually show the positive impacts of people of, of color and diverse background being in cybersecurity. I mean, thinking about some of the national security issues that we're going to be facing as um, like things like quantum computing advance and how different perspectives and people from diverse backgrounds will actually be key to helping secure the nation if we mobilize into it. Like, I think the reason, the reasoning behind why uh, black people or my other minorities should get into cyber, that narrative from the beginning is one that they're going to pick up when they go into it. And if it's more kind of like a, we just want you to serve us, sometimes it can be harmful. But on the other end, I would say, I mean, the harmful part of the conversation is that a lot of it just stays conversation. I would say that's, that's a pretty big thing. Yeah. And I agree with you. And you said something earlier, which is like, there are so many ways to be in this field and you don't have to be hyper technical you don't have to come in and have like you know a massive love of coding etc i was an english major for undergrad i'm a lawyer i work in um, cyber and tech now and i think that that's really powerful um, to be able to say like hey this is a career field that embraces diversity and diversity of thought and background in that way um, but it is something that holds us back when we also use acronyms and terms that people don't understand and we, we create this insular community that seems very difficult to, um, to join and be part of. And so I would say that that's maybe like uh, something we need to, to do a little bit less of in terms of embracing folks who are coming at this, especially from a non-technical background. If I can, may I add something yeah. to what Caitlin just shared? I also think just the language that we use. So I mentioned earlier, like the term cybersecurity can be can turn people off right off the bat. So I think as part of the discussion of bringing different types of people in, especially younger people, is making it very accessible and explaining what we mean when we say cybersecurity. So are you interested in misinformation? Are you interested in whatever? And then just pull that out a little bit more because I think a lot of times we use the term and we don't understand how that falls on people. So um, It's interesting. I was at a um, corporate event last week uh, of CISOs who are gathering, acronym exclusionary, um, <laughs> and one of the um, issues, one of, the, one of them talked about um, their sense that 20 years from now that term Chief Information Security Officer will 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 be gone. That it will be redefined as something else because it's and this actually links back to um, what Kemba was talking about as well. Is that it's not just information security. It's bringing in other issues of privacy and risk and policy. There's some insurance elements to it, and that if you framed it that way. Um, you also have very different backgrounds of people coming in. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say, this is something that we're exploring as we think about how to communicate cybersecurity to the black community in Tulsa, like asking about protective instincts versus making them wonder about, you know, do you have certain technical backgrounds? I mean, a large percentage of the reason why many of the verticals in tech look the way they do is because of how we talk about them. So that's 100%. That's like, you made it, I mean, some of this stuff as I'm reading it, I'm like, it, I do this for a living? Like, wait a minute, like, wait a minute. Like, is this, like, and it's, it's, it's how you communicate things matter yep. because it, it allows, it dictates how a person is going to be able to plug into, into a framework. And if the way you plug into that framework looks or sounds a certain way, you're going to discourage a lot of people from even touching it to begin with. So these are all um, aspects of a, of a topic that, that people who know me is very near and dear to me is around that idea of narrative and the power of narrative. Yep. But there's also potentially other things going on here. So um, what are other um, barriers that may be systemic uh, when we talk about building more diversity in cybersecurity? I'll let you go first, Tyler. I mean, I think we hit on the biggest ones, to, some of the biggest ones, to be honest. I mean, it's, I think the narrative is a big one. I mean, other, other barriers are some of the same systemic barriers that you will see like across different verticals. But I mean, is there, is there, are there targeted campaigns to get people who don't typically look like the, who don't look like the you know, typical cybersecurity person that we have put forward as the archetype? Are there targeted campaigns to get them involved? Are there different ways that we're workshopping 
how we talk about it, not just generally, but in different specific communities? Do you have people who look like the communities you're trying to recruit actually talking about this, this um, to them? Again, like, are there examples? The, the biggest way to get people to try something new is to see somebody who they can equate with doing it. Mm -hmm. Is that happening? You know, are we being intentional about that or are we just saying we need diverse talent and we're putting ads out and we're looking for certain networks to try to just source it from afar? Or are we just saying we need diverse talent for the sake of saying it because we know it's what's in right now? You know, I think the barriers are numerous and if you want to get super specific, we can, but it's like, it's, it's levels to it. It's levels to it and I think it's not necessarily we don't know what to do, it's are we committed to doing what's necessary to make it. I'm gonna pressure on that. You said we can get super specific. Um, go for it. Well, I think that was it. I mean, again, I think, again, <laughs> as, again, as I'm learning, like, as I'm learning, like, people keep trying to make it seem like this is some complex uh, equation that we need to crack, but no, it goes back to the things that we just said. Like, it's, it's that simple. Do I see somebody who looks like me from a community like mine doing the same thing and telling me I can do it too. Sometimes it's that simple. The human, human ingenuity, like it's, I'm not saying I will solve all the problem, but I think a lot of people would be shocked by how much of the problem could be solved just by things like that. So, I mean, I don't, I don't have a, you know, quantum encrypted, you know, big, big <laughs> answer. It's, it's that, you know, it ain't, it, it's not, you know, it's not as complicated as some people make it to be. It's just a matter of the effort. I'm sorry? So, so, so yeah. pause a sec. I'm going to repeat that because we may have people online who didn't hear you with the mic. So um, for those of you that are online, the question was, um, what about racism? Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, when um, job candidates are looked at who are diverse, is it perceived as lowering the bar? Did I get that right? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, anyone can weigh in on that. Well, I think that is a good point, and I think that that is still something that happens. I don't have any numbers or percentages, but just from living life and working for a couple decades, I, I know that that's true. And so I think that, at least for girl security, we're playing the long game with that. So we want to start with young folks, get them in, get them in the pipeline, and get them in so that they're going to be in... 10, 15 years, the ones that are going to be looking at those resumes and the ones that are going to be deciding on the candidates that are coming in and stuff. So I think that that, is, that racism issue is there. It's like the dirty little secret in the room, but it is something that I think we have to play the long game on. It just, I think over time and as, as the director mentioned in his opening statements, you know, the United States is changing demographically. So at some point, you know, the people on the other side of the table doing the interviews and reviewing the resumes are going to be the ones making those decisions. And by default, that that racism issue will hopefully be be minimized a bit more. Yeah, and, and when I speak to systemic issues, I sometimes I have to clarify that I mean racism because I talk about it so much. I mean, I live in a community that was burned down because of it. So a lot of times it's like when it comes to racism, it's like I understand that's a thing, but at this point, I'm, I'm trying to focus on what I can do for my people, how we can help, because I can't change anybody's hearts. I love DEI training. I think everybody should learn about it, but it's like, look, man, I can't. If, if you're going to do that, my focus is going to be to figure out how to circumnavigate you and build resources around it. I'm not, I'm not trying to evangelize you. That's who you are. You want to storm the Capitol, you can do what you want to do. But, but I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to work, I'm going to work to make the country better the way I know I can. But yeah. all right, I'm gonna, well, I shouldn't let you do that, but okay. I, I'm gonna disagree with you. If you wanna storm the Capitol, you can't. You can't, no, you can't do that. You can't do that, but I can't, I don't know if I can stop you. Not you again. Do, you do what you wanna do. Okay, um, Caitlin, you wanna do it? Well, I think, you know, we talk about systemic racism, and like, wow, this is a really big problem, and it's very multifaceted, and it's true, but there are low-hanging fruit. There's things that we could do now, and we should have been doing, um, and that part of it is, in recruitment, a person like me looking at applications, why are you putting forward a job application that like, you say you want diverse professionals to apply and diverse talent to apply, but the very qualifications you have 
are painting a picture of the applicant you're truly looking for. And it's a person who has a certain number of years of experience, who is able to afford to go to a certain school, who probably has the connections because they're white and straight and they know certain people that are also white and straight. And I think that's really difficult. I think like you can't go forward and say, oh, this is such a difficult problem. I have no means of solving it at all. I'm going to throw my hands up and be concerned about why folks aren't applying or taking these jobs. I think that that's ridiculous. And I think, too, there's this, you know, let's put forward unpaid internships. Who's taking those? It's people whose parents can afford to foot their bill, et cetera. Um, and I mean, I've taken a lot of unpaid internships and had to live off credit cards. It's horrible. It sucks. Um, and so I think that we need to really put our focus, you know, we say this is our focus in terms of hiring, but we don't actually do it. We don't even take the five minutes it would take to tailor um, our work and make a targeted approach. You're right. Um, I think, too, we don't focus on retention nearly enough, right? Um, we talk about systemic racism in terms of hiring and in terms of inclusive hiring in particular. But we don't talk about the people we hire, how we structure layoffs, for example. We don't talk about how we care about people in their work, support them when they're in their jobs, especially during the pandemic. Are we reaching out to people and making sure that they are seen and heard? Do we have tools in place to make sure that their voices are respected in something as simple as a Zoom call? So I think all of that is important. It's something that can change very, very quickly to adapt um, and something we already should have changed. If we're, if we're doing that work today, that's great, but it should have been built into our processes from the start. So um, in his opening remarks, Paul um, painted a picture of a new America that demographics mean definitely will happen, a more diverse America. Can you paint a picture of the cybersecurity field moving forward? And in particular, are there key gaps in DEI efforts that need to be filled to achieve that vision? Yes. So I'm going to tell you guys a little anecdote. So I, a couple of semesters ago, I taught a class with a colleague who's a cybersecurity expert at American University. It was about disinformation. And we had some interesting conversations with our students about if that, if the course was a cybersecurity course or if it was something else. And someone told me, oh yeah, great, you know so much about cybersecurity. And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an intel person. Like, I don't know much about this. And they said, yeah, but we're talking about disinformation. That's a cybersecurity issue. And I said, no, it's not. It's a sociological issue. And, and then someone else said, it's actually both. And so my point is, in the future, I think that Cybersecurity is going to be a mishmash of people with tech backgrounds and legal backgrounds and humanities backgrounds and um, communications backgrounds because cybersecurity is all of that. And I think the better we do at explaining that, it's not just this siloed thing. It is, it's an art and a science, and it mixes in so many different things. You know, CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, ex on their website, define cybersecurity as the art, the art of protecting networks and information. I thought that was beautiful because it is an art, and it's art and a science. But I think that in the future, we're going to have, we're going to move away from that CISO framework that you were talking about, and we're going to have people that define cybersecurity as all of the above. And it's not a siloed approach. It's very, very integrated. So that's my first answer to my question, my question, answer to your first question. And the second one about the gaps, I think is related. It is those gaps in DEI when it comes to cybersecurity is making sure that people know they can get in where they fit in. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in this, you're you can do this and be in the cybersecurity realm. If you're interested in this, you can do this and be in the cybersecurity realm. So it really is about the narratives and the words that we use that we talked about earlier that I think that's a gap we can fill. And that will bring in, if the more you diversify what cybersecurity means, the more diverse types of people you're going to be able to bring in. And I'm not just saying racial diversity. I'm talking about neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm talking about different, differently abled. You know, there's so many different types of abilities and, and definitions of diversity that, we'll, that we can bring in if we diversify the meaning of cybersecurity. 
Yeah, that, that speaks to the overall like trend of what we kind of push at Black Tech Street and the overall trend in tech. Tech is being redefined as not just the technology, but the ecosystem around it. Yeah. And once you broaden that definition to the ecosystem around it, you have exponentially more pathways to, to interact with something. So I think that the diversification of and, and the expansion of how you define it will probably be what, what is going to get the most diverse perspectives. I would really just co-sign that. But again, when it comes to the gaps in the efforts, like continuing to go back to what was said earlier, I think Share the Mic and Cyber was an incredible, like I think this is like, you know, go ahead. Like that's an incredible pathway that needed to exist that hadn't. Um, and I think the more you see things like that, that's that's how we'll make we'll make progress. Yeah, I love that. I think that's all incredibly important. Um, and Something I hear really often in the queer community too is like nothing about us without us. Yep. And so it's not just, you know, building this ecosystem, all being part of it, but also who has the power, right? Who has the power to create rules, set norms. Um, it's just so important to make sure that we're not only there, but we're representative um, and, and we're speaking out and we have the ability to make change. So I, I hope that that's part of our, our shared future. Yeah, that's actually interesting. My community has a different take on the saying, it's what you do for me without me, you do to me. Oh, so when it comes to you building out what the future of cybersecurity looks like, if we're sitting like here in ivory towers with other people saying, what does it look like? You've already failed. You got to get out there and say, what does this look like? You know, how does this, how does this, how do you, how do you see a pathway into this? How does what you already have, the skills you already have, translate to one of the base skills that is crucial to cybersecurity or any other vertical. That's, that's how you, that's the starting point. And if I can add one other thing, um, Safi, yeah. um, we were listening in the back and I heard your question to Kemba, which I thought was great. And it was about making it real. Like someone who has to go to Starbucks on an open Wi-Fi and pay their bills you know, that is, that's a huge vulnerability. So I think part of our future too is making cybersecurity really relevant and practical. This is why this is important to you, you know? And, and it, I think it's really relevant when it comes to like digital rights and privacy and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like that's just real stuff. And if, if we put it in those terms, yeah, healthcare, right. everything, if we put it in those terms, cybersecurity isn't just this thing over here. This is like real stuff if, um, involved in your life. If we figure out a way to do that, collectively, I think that would really encourage people to want to be interested in the field. Because one of the things we, we, I see, I've seen in girls' security, some girls and young people like to come to the field because of a personal experience they had as a child. And I think that that's true for a lot of us. We end up where we end up because of something that happened to us as a child or some experience we had, something that caught our attention and that drives our interest. So I think the same with this field. You know, if people really realize how it impacts them on a day-to-day -day basis, they might be more interested to coming in and participating. So I'm going to end with um, one last question before we turn it over to the audience, but it's uh, about the audience. So we have this new group of fellows who are kicking off um, a year's worth of research and project building, um, but they're also, in a certain way, they're, they're representative of a broader set of people that are either at the start or in the middle of their careers in this space. So um, what's one bit of advice that you would give either to our fellows and or someone working in the field? I would say with your work, and I applaud you all for being fellows, I think that's so awesome, is challenge your assumptions. So as you do your research, as you talk to people, as you, as you approach the work, challenge your assumptions along the way and think about, is this relevant? Is this, is this applicable to a wide range of people? So that's what I would say. I think a lot of times when we, we do our work and we, we talk and we make comments, we, we work from preconceived ideas about whatever, and they're not all bad, but I think sometimes it's good as we move along with projects and stuff to challenge whatever assumptions we're, we're, we're making along the way to make sure our, your work is as, as solid as it can be. So that's, that's my humble advice. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> It would, to riff off that, it would be root the things that you research in some of the most real problems you can imagine. Because when things are rooted in real problems that touch people immediately and tangibly, that's a phrase I often use, immediately and tangibly, those are the things that get picked up the quickest. Those are the things that scale the quickest. Those are the things that are going to have the most long-lasting long change. So, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I do want to hear about the human experiences you're exploring when it comes to, to cyber, whether that's you know, getting folks the resources they need in order to have access or protecting them while, while they're online. Um, I think, too, this is a unique opportunity. You're surrounded by people who support you and are just so excited to learn about you and your work. And so I think just reach out. Use folks as resources. Understand that institutions are here, too, and those often have ties to others in the community. And so leverage those. Make sure that you're you know, using all the tools in your toolbox. And um, you know, if you have questions, reach out. Everyone here in this room, I'm sure, would love to get an, an email or you know, be on, on the phone with you or text and make sure that they're supporting. Um, and I think that's a, it's a unique opportunity, right? It doesn't always happen that way in DC. There are a lot of closed doors here. And so I would just say leverage the ones that are open to you. Great, great ideas. So let's turn it over to the audience. Um, and I uh, believe, um, you know, actually, Lauren's going to run the mic to folks. Um, is that the question? Or no, you're going to the mic. OK. <laughs> well, <have> <laughs> She's going to roast us. <laughs> uh, can I start with a question? Absolutely. OK. I'm going to I'm going to. And, and actually, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, for people online who may be just joining in uh, or watching on tape, if you could introduce yourself uh, before the question. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Zabrick, co-founder of Share the Mic and Cyber, and one of the advisors on the actual fellowship program. Um, so I have a policy question, but first I just want to show, like, throw you all some love. Drina, amazing work. I love girl security. I'm a mentor, and I just everything that you're doing is incredible. Tyrants, I'm such a fan of yours. I think Black Tech Street is just so innovative and incredible, and I'm so glad you're here. And you know, Caitlin is such a great example of someone. You know, you're talking about these like micro actions to make people feel valued and and, and appreciate and belong. She is a perfect example of someone who does that. So I just want to throw you all that love. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I was on a panel the other day where we were talking about banning TikTok, right? <laughs> and I, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you your opinions on it because I know it's you know there might be controversy there. Um, and you know, I, I acknowledge, look, there are enormous national security concerns, right? But there are so many people who, and businesses, who depend on that particular lifeline. And I think banning it outright without you know, a communication strategy, without maybe like an off-ramping or a, you know, an alternative or anything like that, I think can be really damaging to you know, a lot of different people, you know, different communities, you know, especially when we're thinking about equity, right? Um, and something that really changed my thinking on this, I was actually speaking with a formerly incarcerated black man about cryptocurrencies. And I was like, oh, we should like regulate and you know, all this stuff. And, and he really, you know, made me understand that for him, and of course at the time, you know, cryptocurrency was a way towards building wealth for, you know, him and, and for people like him who really have been cut off from accessing those pathways towards wealth. And it just really changed my, my thinking on that. And so, Tyrants, you said, what you do without me is what you do to me. And so I was really thinking about that in terms of this question. And so I just want to throw it to you, you know, how would you create a policy around, you know, the use of, of you know, potentially harmful, you know, social media to national security while taking into account, you know, this equity issue? So that's really interesting because the governor of Oklahoma just signed an executive order to ban TikTok, um, you know, in, in, but specifically on like government, government um, channels. And I mean, that's, that's interesting. But if you're talking about balancing, I mean, maybe it is just not using it on government channels. I mean, but banning it all outright, clearly that could have some issues. But at the same, in the same breath, there are also plenty of other social media platforms that businesses can leverage to, you know, uh, used to do well, but the cryptocurrency thing is an is an interesting is an interesting conversation. Um, simply because cryptocurrency and Web three has been billed as one of the main ways that like people who typically don't get a good sh a fair shake at the typical financial system can you know use it to build wealth. And I think, but like everything in life, I think there's a happy medium. You can't have something without regulation. I mean. The recent headlines have really shown us what can happen when that happens. But there's a way to think about things and systems differently without throwing them entirely and completely away. And I think that that's, that's kind of the medium and the line that we have to walk. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not a policy expert. I'm probably not the best person you could ask that question to. But if you wanted my opinion, I would. that's probably what I would say. 
I definitely can't say to ban TikTok. I don't think that'd be. I don't think that'd be a good look. Um, but no, I, I, wanted, I don't want you to have to like come out on either side. Just you yeah. know, policies around that and thinking about you know equity and inclusion and and you know just policies. I think should serve its constituents, right? So how do we best serve, basically? I mean, you mentioned um, the formerly incarcerated or currently incarcerated population. I think we drive a lot of resources to what information people get and trying to limit that information. Um, that's a population who struggles with access, um, more so than I think any of us you know, really contemplate um, enough. And it's a population that maybe um, when, when you're in prison or jail, you're not allowed to access the internet. You're not allowed to be on a platform. You're expected um, to, to exit those institutions and be able to operate in a setting um, where everything is digital now, right? And I think that's really difficult. When we're talking about prisons or jails, we're, we're also thinking about access to information that's off of platforms too, right? Books in prisons are highly regulated. Queer books in particular, um, books about the LGBT experience or romances, et cetera, are um, disallowed at many, many prisons across the US. If you look at the banned books list in these jails, they often target books um, that speak to people's experiences and sexuality. And so I think it's really important when we're thinking about policy, we often focus on like, how do we protect people from bad information, um, whatever we construe as bad information, but we're not thinking about these very fundamental access questions, which aren't even about like how to access TikTok maybe in, in prison or jail or after. It's about like, how do I even like read a book when I'm in jail about you know, something I care about. Um, and so I think that's critical, right? We need to drive more attention to things like that that just feel like they're, they're not being um, focused on in general discourse. And uh, just, just a, another full disclosure, I don't even have TikTok downloaded because the moment <laughs> it came out, I have refused. To, to, to engage, not because even before the social, even before the, the security issues came out. Yeah. Um, so no, I'm not saying to ban it, but I think that I think that the conversation about access, I think it's broader than TikTok, and I don't know that it should start there. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I don't have it either. I will never. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to write a lot, so I keep my thoughts in track. So I'm Michael. Um, I actually work for CISA, um, and I have to say personal capacity, it's not the government's view. With that being said, I don't have TikTok on my phone. <laughs> um, I'll also be fired. Um, so, but as a government employee, um, I have one of the highest clearances you can get in government. Um, I love my job. I think I do a lot of cool things because of the clearance. That said, when I'm in these classified meetings, I look around and like, I'm the only person of color in this room. Mm -hmm. And also there's probably maybe one other woman in the room. Um, and you know it's 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 interesting because I know people of color or any in if you're part of the marginalized community or disenfranchised community I think we all do the same thing of look around the room like okay cool um, and but part of it too is and this hasn't come up in the conversations yet and if there's more time I was going to ask Kemba this about how we're trying to be more inclusive in the federal government space because it is very scary to try to work for federal government um, not police which because federal government had a huge role in disenfranchising marginalized communities. Yeah. And we don't necessarily do a good job of being a Sherpa and helping those who want to get in national security in federal government because you, the form you have to fill out is extremely lengthy. It takes several months, uh, if you're lucky, you, sometimes it's years to get part of this clearance process. Um, and you need to know people. Uh, I mean, I think you mentioned earlier about internships, especially in DC, it is such a closed community that if you don't know somebody, it is really impossible, near impossible to get part in the policy space. It's a tight-knit community, especially trying to work on the Hill. And the only reason why I was able to work in the Senate was because I had a network that I was able to leverage. And it felt weird that I had to like reach into that versus just my own qualifications. And so I say all that, and it's even worse at the state and local level. I used to do um, work at the state and local level. and. You know, we, people always talk about how private sector approaches people from the federal government because of salaries. I mean, we do the same thing at state and local level. And so it's just, it gets worse and worse as you go down the government chain. And uh, the government does so much, right? I mean, you're talking about how Oklahoma just banned TikTok 
how, how many people in the diverse community work for Oklahoma State and even at the local community, um, and it's just it's a problem. So I'm curious for any of y'all, what are you trying to do in terms of for those who are interested in trying to work government, how are you engaging with local, state, federal level, and what are some of the ways we can start breaking down those barriers? Well, I'll start. Thank you for that. Very, very good question. So I'll start by, by sharing just real quick as you did. So I've worked at the federal level too, looked around the room like, hmm, okay. And I worked at the local level too. And I remember uh, trying to build a team of analysts at the local level, the Fusion Center. And we would get some applications, maybe a couple of, of people of color, and, but mostly not. And it was very difficult to, to build a, a very diverse looking team because of the people who would apply, who knew about the position, who were interested in it. And it was very difficult uh, for me as a black woman to not be able to facilitate that even though I wanted to. So um, I, sorry, I forgot. What was, what, was, what was the last part of your question? Just how we could start breaking down some of the barriers yes. and entry into government and make it more appealing really. Absolutely. So I think that that's a big part of what, what we're trying to do at Girls Security. So not only are we um, exposing them, um, generating interest, and training them to know how to, to navigate themselves in the field, particularly for those who want to go into federal government, be that military, intel, community, whatever, um, build, getting those skills for them. And then also, because of the way we're structured with our mentorship program, connecting them with people who can be their sponsors, who can be allies and help them. I think you're right, and I thought, I thought your point was well taken when you said you were able to leverage your network, but it felt kind of weird to have to do that, but that's just the way the game is played right now. So we are trying to help people to be able to have their own skills and own qualifications, but also have their network of people and sponsors who can help them because that's just the way the game is played right now. And hopefully one day it doesn't have to be that way. People can get in on their own qualifications, and but that's that's an idealized world. <laughs> I think there's a so there's a conversation about how the network works, but then there's also a conversation about trust. Um, it goes back to what you said earlier. Every minority group, the most heinous thing that's been perpetrated on them has been by the government, almost in in some way, shape, or form. So I mean, when it comes to the trust factor, how do you initiate a culture shift that you know is going to allow minorities to more so funnel into the government, understanding that that is the best, um, the best mechanism that we have for change. But that's, I'm just taking the other side. I think the network side is spoken to. I mean, cultures develop around that, you know, the closed door culture. That's one conversation. But I do think this other conversation that is pretty crucial is for us to reshape how we see the government, not just, also not just in terms of trust, but also in terms of the role it plays in innovation. I mean, I worked, I worked for, for the mayor before I, of Tulsa before I jumped into tech, and part of why I left is because I realized that some of the most crucial innovations that are going to solve the problems in the 21st century aren't going to come out of policy in the government. They're going to come from the private sector. So how do, you, how do you make A, government more innovative, and B, build a better cultural trust between the government and, and minorities that make it a more appealing option? And that's interesting because um, that's one of those sort of uh, second order systemic issues because one of the things that's slightly different about the cybersecurity industry is that X government job often is what gets you into mm -hmm. a more senior leader yeah. role. Right. There's only a couple of industries like that, the defense contractor role, but when, if you look at the background of executives or managers in the cybersecurity industry, it's often so-and-so used to be assistant secretary of X, or so-and-so used to be an FBI, FBI agent for Y, and yet they're moving into mm -hmm. um, either laterally or high up in cybersecurity either companies or a non-cyber company, but they're in that information security role within it because of X government service, which is not the case in a lot of other realms. So it has sort of a double effect that you talk about. It's not just, oh, looking around the room in government. If you're pulling from government for leader roles, mm. it continues on. And so, so how do you break that down? 
Um, did you want to get in on this, this question? Or? No, I mean, <laughs> I think that was all exactly right. I'm thinking now about judges and the same thing with judges, right? They're coming from big law firms, they're coming mm -hmm. from, from yeah. government, um, and it does create those knock-on effects. And I do want to say it is, it is odd that we have this discomfort about using our network. I had the same feelings even when you um, apply to join a, a state bar. You have to put down every address you've ever lived and someone who still lives in that city. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> well, you know, I don't know all these people. And it, it's hard when you've moved around a lot, et cetera. Um, and something that I'm working through right now is this state, um, the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court bar. You have to have two recommendations from current US state, US Supreme Court barred attorneys. Who are those people? I don't know those people, right? Um, and so I think, uh, thanks. I think it's interesting when you don't have the network to leverage and you have to start making connections. Um, but I just think that's why it's so important for us to create our own networks and create those now um, in anticipation of next generations because I don't want it to be this difficult for, for those coming next. And that's one of the ideas of SHARE. So we've got time for one last question in the back there. Great. I'll make it quick. Watch out, uh, first, my name is Connor <laughs> Godfrey, and I work for the George Kaiser Family Foundation, which is the biggest place-based philanthropy in the world, to the best of our knowledge. And I introduce it like that because my question is actually about geography. I would love to hear the panel riff a little bit on the intersection between kind of racial and community diversity and geographic diversity. I think it's almost axiomatic at this point that cyber is a team sport. Uh, you know, Caitlin, I'll put you on the spot. Do you know where Google's okay. biggest data center in North America is? Oh, I have no idea. I'll give you a hint. There, 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 are, two, <laughs> there are two Tulsans in the room. <laughs> Sorry, so I actually, George Kaiser Family Foundation is based in Tulsa, um, so I have the privilege of working with tyrants on a number of projects, but it's right, to, right outside of Tulsa, but whether it's critical infrastructure and energy and aerospace manufacturing, right, so we have different regional flavors that require cyber talent and technology. I certainly don't want it all going to Fort Meade, right? Like, I think we need to look to our own backyard first. So we'd love to hear a bit of a riff uh, on the intersection of, of, of talent, recruitment, geography, et cetera. I'm looking we, at you. We have this conversation all the time. So I was actually going to, you and, um, oh, OK. OK, well, OK. So, <laughs> you know, Connor, when I got put on the spot, I realized how it get a little more concise. You wanted, you wanted to, so the intersection between geography and, you know, and race. So when it comes to uh, attracting talent specifically, so this is a nut that Tulsa really tries to really tries to crack. Um, a lot of money gets poured into it because you know the diversity of the talent pool of a geography, you know, plays heavily. If if not, isn't the single biggest determining factor of where that geography is going to go economically, what kind of society it's going to build, things like that. So when it comes to the interplay of of those two, I mean. People want to come and live in communities where they have a, a flourishing ecosystem, where there's an abundance of opportunities, and where they feel like they have access to the things that are most crucial for them to build what they feel will be a, a good life. And when I say build a good life, I don't just mean economics. I'm talking about have certain impacts. Um, is this city connected in a way that's going to allow me to have a highway to impacting other places as well? So to specifically anchor that in cybersecurity, um, as Connor and I talk about a lot, the University of Tulsa actually has one of the best cybersecurity programs in the country. I think it was number two, ranked number two at one point. What, correct? I, I wish, number 25. 25, <laughs> I thought. It was, it, was, it was high up there. And there's, you know, there's relationships with government agencies. And I was actually having this conversation yesterday when I first got in D.C. I, I linked up with a friend of mine, and he was talking about how different geographies have these things called endowments. Here, D.C.'s biggest endowment is the federal government. Um, we were actually talking about how Prince George and Charles County are the two wealthiest black counties in the entire country because so many of them, people work for the government and they can stay there for years, they get good jobs and all of that. So when it comes to geography and, like, and race and things like that, I would say it's really about thinking about what are the endowments of a geography and how can those be leveraged to make it a more inclusive or vibrant and inclusive environment. So um, we are both running out of time for this panel, 
but actually at the start of a marathon for the fellows. Um, and I want to um, end by thanking you all for um, sharing your insights with us, but also um, invite you to stay linked and um, run that marathon with us in the year ahead. So please join me in a round of applause. And with that, we're going to exit the stage, and I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Christina, to um, close us out with some remarks. Oh, okay. Thanks to the panel again, and thanks to Peter. Um, so a couple of things that I learned today, actually, I'm, I'm here to, for my learnings too, right? And this panel uh, was excellent, by the way. Uh, challenging your assumptions that's super important and i didn't realize how much we do this so i'm going to challenge the fellows to challenge their assumptions as they go through some of the research um, what you start with or the idea that you started with may not be the output or the outcome that you end up with and that's okay right be flexible because you don't know what you're going to create so that was gold. I love that. I'm going to continue to use that. Um, leverage, leveraging open doors. I love that because I too do not like reaching out to my network. It's so uncomfortable. I, it's, it's, it's like one of the most challenging things, but I think it's important to get comfortable with doing that, right? Be okay with saying what you want because as they say, a closed mouth doesn't get fed, right? Um, focus on incremental changes, so like doing the work. I think that's su that's critical. I think a lot of times, I know myself, I sometimes get overwhelmed because it feels like I'm trying to climb a mountain and can't do it all in one afternoon, one day. And so I think that it's important that if we do want to change the face of cybersecurity, um, national security, that we have to do it incrementally. It's not going to be done overnight. So thank you for that reminder. I thought that was uh, really good. Um, and lastly, just the takeaway of building your network and walking through these open doors, another gold nugget. I mean, we did gold nuggets today. I'm like, I'm glad I woke up at four in the morning. Um, just, you know, Open the door, like the door was already open for you, um, especially in an environment with so many closed doors. So walk in, walk in, don't have a seat, but walk in. Um, and again, just remember all these, I know there's a lot, there's gonna be a lot of information today, but if you remember nothing else, just remember that um, there's so much opportunity and that is just here for the taking, right? So get warmed up and definitely reach out to us if there are any issues and questions. We don't always have all the answers, but I think together we can figure it out. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited for uh, what's to come. I'm more excited for lunch because I didn't have breakfast. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, in closing, I think that's that's about it. I'm super, super excited to, to meet you all. And uh, for those folks online, hello and goodbye. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope you have a, a fantastic day and a fantastic journey. Thank okay. you.